Hello and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast. The history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. And this is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and The Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 41, Yaroslav the Wise. So here we are. After 20 years of internecine warfare, Yaroslav finds himself, somewhat accidentally, on the throne of a united Rus. We have to think that the chronicler would have been going out of his way to make the man that many might argue was Rus' greatest ruler look good. But he didn't look that great so far, did he? He won some battles, fair enough, but lost others. Repeatedly lost control of his realm and had to run away to save his skin. He made a big mess of his first attempt to get into international diplomacy. Killed a couple of brothers, imprisoned another one. He's certainly displayed a talent for staying alive, but he's not really made a case for being called the wise. So let's see what the tale of bygone years has to say about his reign and see if this changes. And if you're wondering how long we're going to be tackling the tale like this, Yaroslav is the last. As I noted last time, we're entering into the period in which it shifts from being a semi or entirely legendary tales about the past into people writing about things that they actually know about that happened within reasonable memory. And that means that it will go from being descriptions of a reign that we can summarize in 10 minutes to having actual details of events that we can refer to along with other sources. Our story picks up after Mstislav's death while out hunting. Yaroslav assumes sovereignty as the sole ruler of Rus. In what is becoming a tradition, his first move is to appoint his son Vladimir as the Prince of Novgorod. With an eye to the changes underway, he also appoints a man named Zhidyata as Bishop of Novgorod. While still at Novgorod, he hears that the Pechenegs are besieging Kiev. Gathering an army of Varangians and Slavs, he returns to the city. The Pechenegs were innumerable. Yaroslav sallies from the city, placing the Varangians in the centre, the men of Kiev on the right, and the men of Novgorod on the left. They met the Pechenegs on the fields outside Kiev, where the church of St. Sophia now stands. In fierce combat, the Rus triumphed, and the Pechenegs fled in every direction. Yaroslav builds the great cathedral in Kiev, near the Golden Gate, and founds the church of St. Sophia and a number of other churches. The tale tells us that in his reign, the Christian faith was fruitful and multiplied. The number of monks increased, and new monasteries were opened. Yaroslav, it says, loved religious establishments and priests, especially monks. He also loved books and read them continually, day and night, as well as gathering scribes and translators. He wrote and collected many books, says the tale. Quote, For as one man ploughs the land, and another sows, and still others reap and eat food in abundance, so did this prince. His father, Vladimir, ploughed and harrowed the soil when he enlightened Rus through baptism, while this prince sowed the hearts of the faithful with the written word, and we in turn reap the harvest by receiving the teaching of books. End quote. The tale goes on a while longer about the wonders of books, the immeasurable depth, the wisdom, the consolation. He who reads books, it says, converses with God and holy men. And Yaroslav loved books. He wrote them and deposited them in the church of St. Sophia. He founded other churches and paid the priests out of his own pocket, bidding them to teach the people. And what is the result that we get? Entry for 1038. Yaroslav attacked the Yatvindians. 
Entry for 1040. Yaroslav attacked Lithuania. Entry for 1041. Yaroslav attacked the Mazovians. In 1041, for variety, Vladimir, son of Yaroslav, attacked the people of Yam and conquered them. In a context-free piece of detail, the chronicler tells us that the horses of Vladimir's soldiers died and they tore the skins off the horses while they were still breathing. In 1043, Yaroslav sent his son Vladimir to attack Greece, that is, Byzantium. A great storm broke up the ships of the Rus, damaging even the prince's ship. 6,000 soldiers were cast onto the shore and wanted to return to Rus, but the prince and his retainers stayed on their ships. The emperor, Monomach, sends 14 ships to pursue them. When Vladimir and his retainers see the Greek pursuit, they wheel around to meet them, disperse the Greek ships, and then return to Rus. Meanwhile, the stranded soldiers are taken to Constantinople and blinded. Back in Kiev, Yaroslav has married his sister to Casimir of Poland, who sends 800 captives taken by Boleslav back as a wedding gift. Up in Polotsk, which you'll recall remains outside of Yaroslav's control, Bratislav, the son of Izyaslav, dies and is succeeded by his son, Vsyaslav, who the tale says was born by enchantment and is, for that reason, pitiless in bloodshed. In 1045, Yaroslav takes a break from attacking various places to found the Church of St. Sophia in Novgorod, but in 1046 he's back to the old ways. He attacks the Mazovians, kills their prince, Moislav, and makes them the subjects of Casimir. In 1048, Yaroslav's wife dies. In 1051, Yaroslav appoints Ilarion as Metropolitan of Rus in the Church of St. Sophia. And the tale gives us a digression explaining how the Monastery of the Caves came by its name. Apparently, a virtuous presbyter named Ilarion used to like to walk from Beristova to the hill where the Monastery of the Caves is now and pray in the woods there. He dug a little catacomb and used to go there to chant mass and pray in private. And then God inspired Yaroslav to appoint him as the Metropolitan. A few days later, there was a layman from Lubech who God had inspired to go on a pilgrimage. He went to Mount Athos where he desired to become a monk himself. The monks of Mount Athos made him a monk and gave him the name Antonius, and then sent him back to Rus to be an example to others. He returned to Kiev and looked at the monasteries. He did not like any of them and ended up wandering the hills looking for the place that God would show him. Finally, he came to the hill where Ilarion had dug his cave. This was the place. He praised the Lord and took up his abode. He prayed, ate dry bread every other day, drank water moderately, and dug the caves. He did not rest, day or night. Good men noticed his work and provided for his needs. He became known as the Great Antonius, and people came to him for his blessing. The next line of the tale is, quote, When the great prince Yaroslav died, Isyaslav, his son, inherited his domain and settled in Kiev, while Antonius was celebrated throughout Rus. I don't know about you, but that seems like a bit of a bizarre turn in the story to me. Yaroslav appears as a kind of afterthought as we stay with the story of Antonius. And by stay, I mean the story of the Monastery of the Caves goes on for several more pages. And we return to the actual subject of the tale only with the line, Vladimir, Yaroslav's eldest son, died at Novgorod and was buried in the church of St. Sophia. And you might be surprised here to learn that Yaroslav himself isn't even dead yet. 
But we have only one more entry before his death. In 1054, Sievolod, his son, has a son with his Greek princess and names him Vladimir. In 1054, Yaroslav passes away, and that's where we will stop today. The tale records what is called Yaroslav's Testament, where he attempts to settle the succession, but we'll leave that for another episode. Did that summary leave you feeling like you know exactly why Yaroslav is called the Wise and his reign is regarded as ushering in the Golden Age of Rus? No? Well, let's get into the details and find out why. The first thing that should have been clear comparing this segment of the tale to what had come before is that Yaroslav no longer has any challenges within Rus. He is indeed the sole ruler. And although we continue to hear of him fighting almost continually, he's fighting against foreign enemies, not breakaway relatives or rebellious sons. And that means that he naturally turns his mind to building. He had been continuing Vladimir's work since he assumed power in Kiev, even before Mstislav had died. He expanded the network of earthwork ramparts, especially out to the south, and established new settlements along the Ross River, extending the newly populated Kiev hinterland and further entrenching the region as Rus territory and the importance of Kiev as the main centre. After Mstislav's death, Yaroslav picked up on his building plans for Chernihiv, which we discussed last time. Vladimir had not done a huge amount of building in Kiev itself, besides a couple of churches, but that was about to change. Yaroslav took Vladimir's citadel on Starokivske Hill as just one corner of new fortifications enclosing the city or at least the core of around 70 hectares, within three and a half kilometres of walls, oriented towards the south, of course, where the danger had nearly always come from. This was a massive project. The fortification stood on an earthwork base up to 30 metres wide and 11 metres high, topped with timber palisades adding another five metres. There were three main gates. The Jews' Gate in the southwest and the Poles' Gate in the southeast were made of timber, while the Golden Gate at the southern tip was a masonry structure emulating Byzantine models. But like Mstislav's plans for Chernihiv, the building works in Kiev went beyond defensive structures alone. The Rus had now been travelling to Constantinople for a couple of centuries, and the Byzantine capital was the ideal city that any ambitious ruler wanted to rival. Constantinople's skyline was dominated by the Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Patriarch. Vladimir had built the Church of the Mother of God in his citadel on Starokivskaya Hill, a masonry building for the ruling family and the noble guests, but there was still no cathedral for the people. So Yaroslav built his metropolitan, his own Church of St. Sophia, on the road to the Golden Gate. As the Hagia Sophia was the biggest and most magnificent church in Constantinople, St. Sophia's was also to be the biggest and most magnificent church in Kiev, an appropriate seat for the head of the church of a Christian nation. Construction took ten years and it was completed in 1048. Yaroslav built other churches too. There was a church of St. George, which was Yaroslav's baptismal name, and a church of St. Irene, which was his wife's baptismal name. Frescoes in the churches depicted Yaroslav and other members of the ruling dynasty in settings resembling icons, carrying out propagandistic work to reinforce his God-given legitimacy to all the people entering them. 
The basic model for the church was taken from Constantinople. It's a form known as the cross in square or domed cross, a style quite different to the nave and transept form which is based on the Roman basilica that came to dominate in the west. The cross in square church had appeared somewhat later than the basilica form, probably around the end of the 8th century. As the name suggests, it was based on a square floor plan, which was divided by pillars, and these divided spaces are regarded as forming a cross, thus giving it the name. The spatial division was also reflected in the roof construction. The central space had a high vault, with lower vaults in the four corners surrounding it. This basic cube could then be expanded by the addition of further rooms and chapels around the perimeter of the building. Inside, there were also characteristic decorations. Mosaics and frescoes were used to create images that communicated the divine hierarchy. The highest central vault most commonly displays the Christ Pantocrator the Almighty or Ruler of All. This is one of the earliest of the iconic images to develop and derives from Roman imperial models. Christ is shown in a fairly stern-looking pose, holding the New Testament in his left hand and making a gesture of blessing with his right. His halo usually contains a cross and the Greek letters Iota Sigma and Chi Sigma standing for Jesus and Christ, are placed to left and right of the head. Continuing downwards to the lower vaults, you will find the Virgin Mary, the Apostles and Archangels. The frescoes or mosaics on the upper parts of the walls depict biblical scenes commemorated in the major feasts, such as the Nativity and Jesus' presentation at the Temple and the lower part of the walls was reserved for saints, who were regarded as sharing the space with the congregation. The entire ensemble was oriented to be viewed by worshippers entering the church through the western door, and turned the whole church into an iconostasis depicting the orthodox worldview. The frescoes depicting Yaroslav, Vladimir and other members of the ruling dynasty were placed above the western door, where they would be seen by each person as they left the church. The vaults over both these internal spaces and the surrounding peripheral rooms became the onion domes, so characteristic of the Orthodox Church across what would become the Russian Empire. The base of the cube of Yaroslav's cathedral is just over 29 metres by 29 metres, and the height of the central dome is also just under 29 metres. This is not an enormous church compared to the Hagia Sophia, which is almost twice the size, but it was bigger than anything else that Rus had built or would build for another 500 years. It has 13 domes, and the interior is richly decorated with mosaics using 177 different colours and frescoes around the lower walls, all made by imported Byzantine craftsmen. The church really is a Byzantine church. The mosaics only contain inscriptions in Greek. There is no Slavonic here. Frescoes in the private stairwells leading to the gallery show the Hippodrome, musicians, hunts, and similar scenes from Byzantine imperial life. Once this St. Sophia's was completed, the Byzantine craftsmen were sent to Novgorod to build another one there, and more St. Sophia's followed in other towns. While this Greek building work was in progress, a priest called Ilarion was busy creating the Sermon on Law and Grace, the earliest surviving work of literature that we have from Rus. It was most likely written for presentation in the new cathedral. The sermon links to some of the themes that we have seen developed in the tale. 
The first part presents the Christian doctrine of grace superseding the laws of the Old Testament. The second part eulogizes Vladimir and the baptism of Rus and situates Vladimir and therefore the Rus within God's divine plan for creation. We've already covered some of this, like Vladimir as Constantine and so on. Together with the Byzantine-style churches and the Byzantine artists creating work that depicts the Byzantine worldview, that's a whole lot of Byzantium. Books quite often cover this period of Rus' history in a chapter titled Byzantium of the North, Constantinople under Dnieper, or something along those lines. In more popular circles, like blog posts or Twitter threads by amateur history buffs, Rus is sometimes even called a Byzantine vassal. If you recall the interview episode with Monica White, I asked her about the extent to which Byzantium was able to project power northwards, and she said it basically couldn't. Rus was not Bulgaria. In 1971, Dmitry Obolensky wrote an influential work called The Byzantine Commonwealth, Obolensky, who was born Prince Dmitry Dmitrievich Obolensky in St. Petersburg just after the revolution, escaped with his family to Britain along with the Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna and Grand Duke Nicholas. He argued that the peoples who accepted Orthodox Christianity also accepted the principles of Roman Byzantine law and formed an international community in which the Byzantine emperor was the ultimate authority. From this view, Yaroslav's building programs are an example of the periphery imitating the imperial core that they saw as their superior. Christian Raffensperger, on the other hand, argues for the Byzantine ideal rather than the Byzantine commonwealth. That is, that the Rus and other medieval European states emulated the style and accepted the religion and even laws of Byzantium, but that this did not mean that there was an acceptance of imperial hierarchy. According to this viewpoint, Yaroslav and other rulers appropriated Byzantine style rather than copying and adapted it to their own purposes. The Hagia Sophia was the model for St. Sophia in Kiev, but St. Sophia in Kiev looks quite different with its multiple domes, perimeter chambers, and so on, and it went on to create a model for a native style. So the rulers of Rus appropriated the Byzantine symbology to enhance their own legitimacy. Hilarion's claims about the place of Rus in the world were supported by other rulers, demonstrating that they accepted its status. Yaroslav's sister, Dobreniega, baptised Maria, married Casimir of Poland. Three of his daughters married European kings, Harold Hardrada, Andrew I of Hungary, and Henry I of France. Another daughter married the heir to the throne of England, a succession that did not work out in the end, although Yaroslav's granddaughter did become the Queen of Scotland. His son Izyaslav married Gertrude of Poland, Casimir's sister. Sviatoslav married the grandniece of the Holy Roman Emperor, and Siobolod married into the Byzantine imperial family of Constantine IX Monomachus. Franklin and Shepard put it, quote, The overall impression or facade created by Yaroslav's program of patronage and political network is one of completeness, of accomplishment, of grand themes grandly stated and grand goals grandly achieved. The Rus, it seemed, had arrived, perhaps not as a new breed of conquerors and innovators, but at least as distinct enough authentically Christian people with an authentically Christian ruler dwelling in his second Constantinople, protected by the mother of God in St. Sophia, 
On the hills above the right bank of the Dnieper, just as St. Andrew himself had prophesied. End quote. But things are not always as they seem. In 1043, Yaroslav launched a disastrous attack on Constantinople. The disaster was down to natural causes rather than Byzantine defensive prowess or bad Russian planning, as the massive Russian fleet was destroyed by a storm before they could even engage. Irrespective of that, it was the last Rus attack on Constantinople and the last campaign in which the Rus hired a significant force of Varangians, and it marked the end of the Viking Age in Eastern Europe. Yaroslav's friend and son-in-law, Harold Hardrada, was there, recalled from service with the Varangian Guard in Constantinople. He would also be there at the end of the Viking Age in the West, his own failed attempt to invade England. If you'd like to hear more about Varangians and Harold Hardrada, I'm making Members Episode 5, Varangians, available to state councillors on Patreon for a while. Scholars have not fully reached the consensus as to why Yaroslav decided to attack Constantinople at a time when it seemed like the Byzantine influence on Rus was at its zenith. According to Byzantine sources, it was in response to the authorities failing to properly punish the perpetrators after a distinguished Rus merchant was killed in Constantinople. Some scholars have argued it was an attempt by Yaroslav to assert Rus power to Constantinople, to make the Byzantines take it more seriously and demonstrate that Rus had arrived as a power to be reckoned with. Byzantine writings are fairly condescending about basically anyone outside of the core empire, and Yaroslav clearly cared about prestige. Details are missing from the records, but the eventual outcome was that they managed to settle their differences. The Byzantine craftsmen continued to work in Rus, and the Byzantines provided an imperial bride for Yaroslav's son, Vsevolod. Meanwhile, back in Kiev, Yaroslav appointed Ilarion, a native Rus rather than Byzantine, as Metropolitan of Kiev, one of only two native leaders in the first 250 years of the church in Rus. We've already mentioned the absence of attempts by Rus rulers to create laws, one of the key functions of government. The tale even included an instance of the bishops telling Vladimir directly that he needed to do something about lawlessness in his realm. Yaroslav took up this duty and is credited with issuing the first written law in Rus, known as the Ruskaya Pravda. The initial codex, if indeed it existed according to the legend, has been lost. The Ruskaya Pravda was rewritten and recompiled as successive rulers expanded and amended the law, and all that we have are these later versions, which scholars have to use to try to derive what the original might have been. The most common surviving version that can be found is known as the Expanded Pravda. It has 120 articles and was put together sometime around the end of the 12th century. An earlier version, rarer because it is fully incorporated into the Expanded Pravda, is known as the Short Pravda. It dates from around the end of the 11th century and contains 43 articles. Of these 43 articles, 1 to 18 and possibly 42 and 43 are traditionally attributed to Yaroslav and the others to his sons. The hypothetical code extrapolated on the basis of the short pravda is known as the earliest pravda. If we assume that Yaroslav did in fact issue a written code of laws, perhaps one of the books that the Tao claims he loved to write, this would have heralded a major shift in Rus' society. 
Rus was not a literate place. Although it is nearly two centuries since Kirill, Methodius, and their followers invented the alphabets for writing Slavic languages, we have very little evidence that the Rus found it necessary to write anything down. The entire corpus of writing found from Rus before the middle of the 11th century is a pot with a word that could be mustard oil or someone's name, and a couple of wooden blocks that could have been used as tags on sacks of goods. There is no outburst of native writing following the conversion to Christianity, which would naturally have raised the value of writing for the religious life of the people at the very least. Although we have to remember that there could have been much more writing produced than survived, there is a clear picture that writing was rare and therefore only scraps have been found. There's no real evidence for any significant growth in literacy under Vladimir, but under Yaroslav and thereafter, all forms of writing start to become more and more common. So, what kind of things was Yaroslav issuing laws about? Basically, the kind of things you would expect from a starter law kit. Almost everyone agrees that killing members of your community and taking their stuff is bad, and that's where we start here. Article 1 is about killing. Like many ancient law systems, it starts with the assumption that people are going to get killed, and is intended to regulate what other people do about people getting killed, rather than outlawing killing itself. So, fathers, sons, brothers and nephews are allowed to kill in revenge, but also 40 Krivnias may be paid by the murderer instead. Then there are a series of articles on the payments due for assault. You are entitled to 12 Krivnia if you are struck with a sword hilt or goblet. 40 for a serious injury, just 3 for the loss of a finger, but 12 for the loss of your beard. Then come articles on procedures and payments for property crimes, including recovering slaves stolen by Varangians and masters being liable for injuries caused to their slaves. These payments were all in the form of what the perpetrator owed to the victim as compensation rather than fines that were collected by the king or his representatives. This code does not involve the creation of a state structure to administer justice. The king himself does not judge crimes. Essentially, it aims to regulate how local communities handle justice among themselves. Yaroslav issued the law, but did not enforce it. There are parts of the code that are similar to other laws across Scandinavia and Britain, because the law reflected the Varangian origins of the Rus rulers. It's hard to tell how far their customs were different or similar or assimilated into what the Slavic majority in Rus did in their own communities. What is clear, however, to go back to that question of Byzantine influence, is that they didn't take a Byzantine model for these early codes. The laws are clearly a local product. If Yaroslav was not creating a legal system to be administered as part of the state, why did he bother? Well, Yaroslav could have been trying to fulfill the role of Christian ruler, which was seen to include law-giving and providing justice. It could also have been to earn prestige and legitimacy. While the earliest Pravda is extremely practical, the short Pravda, including the parts attributed to his sons, does get more into the role of royal interests and duties, and does include fines payable to the king. It also moves past merely regulating community customs and into making the community responsible to the king. If one of the king's men was murdered, and the murderer was not found or surrendered, then the whole community where he was killed was liable for the blood compensation. 
people were still allowed to kill a murderer or a thief if they caught them in the act, but if one was taken and bound, then they had to be turned over to the king. While the first article of the earliest Pravda limited the right to a revenge killing to the nearest relatives, later additions to the code imposed further restrictions on the right to kill. The tale does not really help us establish when Yaroslav issued his laws. The first Novgorod chronicle claims that he did it in 1016 and includes the whole text of the short Pravda. So we know that that's not true, as his then unborn sons are mentioned in the text. However, scholars do believe that it is possible that Yaroslav issued the laws for Novgorod when he was ruling in Kiev to guide the city now that he was no longer there. Another aspect of the Pravda is characteristic of its age. That is, it's focused on the free men living in the cities of Rus. A woman could be killed without triggering a revenge killing, compensation, or a fine. Unless she was a valuable possession, such as a slave that your family kept as a wet nurse. Whether we are talking about three hryvnia or forty, we are dealing with sums of money that are out of reach of the average subsistence farmer in a small Slavic village or a finno ugrian fur trapper. What kind of people were going around striking each other with sword hilts and goblets? Probably the same kind of people who made up the retinues of kings and local lords. What we are looking at is Yaroslav trying to keep his own men in line. As the first person to become the ruler of Orthodox Rus, historians are naturally interested in the relationship between Yaroslav and the church. The tale gives us no information at all on how the church was organized in the first decades of Christian Rus. But under Yaroslav and his successors, the church was headed by a metropolitan at St. Sophia in Kiev who was under the authority of the Patriarch of Constantinople. The Byzantines called the ecclesiastical province that he headed, Rossiya. We know three metropolitans from Yaroslav's reign, Ioan or John, who was involved in promoting Boris and Gleb as saints, Theophemt, who re-consecrated the Church of the Mother of God that Vladimir had built, And then Ilarion, who, as I mentioned in my starting summary, is the subject of an extended passage in the tale. Before them, all we know of is the Archbishop of Kiev that Tizmar of Merseburg said greeted Boyeswav and Sviatopolk when they took the city, and that Vladimir brought Anastasius with him from Kherson and gave him a church. The Byzantine records suggest that the Metropolitanate of Rossiya was set up in 997, so right around the traditional date of the baptism of Rus. There are some Byzantine records suggesting that there was a Metropolitan named Theophylactus, however it's not clear how much authority he carried. Anastasius appointed to the church that Vladimir built to be his personal church, was likely to have been the most prestigious priest in Kiev. But by Yaroslav's time, Anastasius had run away to Poland, and the new Saint Sophia was clearly the most important church in the city. The construction of Saint Sophia, appropriating but not copying Byzantine models, as already noted, was also part of efforts to make Kiev, rather than Constantinople, the centre of the Orthodox Church in Rus, irrespective of the formal hierarchy. The Byzantines recognised this themselves and called Kiev the ecclesiastical capital of the nation and the rival of the sceptre of Constantinople. Information on the earliest bishops in other cities is, if anything, even more scant. 
Apart from the odd name here or there, we don't really know anything about them for a couple more centuries. Not even how many there were, with scholars arguing for anywhere from four in Belgorod, Novgorod, Chernihiv and Yuryev to seven, with the other three contenders being Polotsk, Pryaslavl and Turov. Except Polotsk and Novgorod, these are all clustered around the Dnieper heartland, outside of which Rus probably remained a still mostly pagan place. The early church in Rus was funded by the ruler himself. As Vladimir had said in the tale, he would give the church a tenth of his processions and the income from his towns. This gave the Church of the Mother of God its other name of the Tithe Church. Nestor tells us that when Yaroslav built a church dedicated to Boris and Gleb in Novgorod, he ordered the local governor to give the church a tenth of the tribute the town paid to Kiev. This money was spent ensuring the church performed its functions, maintaining priests and deacons, holding the services and their daily liturgy. The tale also refers to Yaroslav's grandson, Yaropolk Izyaslavovich, paying a tenth of his income to the church, and the Pravda mentions a tithe from fines. As you might imagine, this made the church dependent on secular power in a way that it was not in other places. But just as it was in other places, the church was also a source of law that could end up competing with secular power especially when it came to things like what constituted lawful sexual relations, how births, marriages and deaths should be celebrated, acceptable clothing and other aspects of personal behaviour. Unlike the Pravda, which rested on local custom, the Church's laws most definitely drew on Byzantine sources. The Nomocanon of 14 titles the most widely used compendium of Byzantine canon law, was translated into Slavonic in the 10th century and used as the basis of the Kormchaya Kniga, the Helmsman's Book, or Book of Guidance, which was used in Rus throughout the medieval period as the source of ecclesiastical law. It underwent continuous revisions as the church tried to integrate itself into society and prevail over local customs. To begin with, there was little overlap and no conflict between secular and canon law. They dealt with separate fields and only crossed over on a couple of crimes like rape and abduction. As each developed and expanded its scope and application, however, they did find themselves forced to work out a way to cooperate. This resulted in Yaroslav's statute, which, like the Pravda, may have originated with Yaroslav himself, but only survives in later, much-revised versions. This statute sets out a range of offences for which the fine is payable to the church, and establishes that there is joint ecclesiastical and secular jurisdiction in things like divorce and adultery. So if Rus had limited literacy, what does the tale mean when it goes on about Yaroslav's love for books and how he had them written and gathered them? But what did that all mean? The chronicler is not talking about him producing Rus' first written laws. Books for medieval Rus and the chronicler meant the scriptures and associated ecclesiastical texts. Nearly all the books created in Rus were translations from Greek into Church Slavonic. You will have probably noticed the tale mentioning this in some of the quotations we've heard over the last few episodes. And it was not seen as anything bad, rather it was a source of pride that Slavonic stood alongside Hebrew, Greek and Latin and enabled the Slavs to hear God's greatness in their own tongue. The expanding church created demand for books, which priests needed to perform their duties and to teach others. 
But there was no demand for the other works that were common in Byzantium and spreading to other parts of Europe as they learned to read and write. No lessons in rhetoric, Greek tragedies, and other secular works. As Franklin and Shepard put it, the Rus did not read the Iliad, either in Greek or in Slavonic. The reason seems to be quite simple. Unlike many of their Western contemporaries, they just did not see Rome as part of their heritage. They did not need to acquire classical knowledge as part of asserting that they were the successors to the classical world. The lands of Rus had not been part of the Roman Empire. They gave it no special status, and they did not claim to be its heirs. It's impossible that the Rus did not encounter the classical intellectual tradition. They travelled to Constantinople for centuries. They cited the magnificence of Byzantine churches as an argument for adopting Christianity. They brought Byzantine artisans to Rus to create buildings and artworks. There was no actual obstacle to them studying the ancient world. If they did not do so, it means that they must just not have been interested. As usual, some things about Yaroslav's reign get left out of the tale. He hosted an unusual number of exiles at his court. Although it might seem logical enough for Olav of Norway to use Rus as a refuge and to leave his son Magnus to grow up there before he too returned to Scandinavia to become king of Norway, others showed Rus expanding its international connections. Andrew of Hungary turned up with his brother Levente after King Stephen had their father blinded. Along with another brother, Biela, they were the children of Ladislaus of Hungary and one of Vladimir's daughters. Biela married a Polish princess and found refuge there. Andrew married Yaroslav's daughter, Anastasia, and stayed in Kiev for a decade before returning to Hungary to recover his throne. When Knut the Great conquered England in 1016, he sent the then infant Edward the Exile, son of Edmund Ironside, to Sweden to be disposed of by Olaf Skotkvenong. But the Swedes allowed him and his entourage to flee to Rus. Edward married Yaroslav's daughter Agafia, and when Andrew retook the throne of Hungary in 1046, Edward followed him to his new home. A decade later, he was summoned home by the childless Edward the Confessor to become his heir in 1054. However, he died mysteriously soon after returning, without even meeting the king. While that marriage did not pan out as far as any influence-building plans Yaroslav may have had, Edward's daughter Margaret married Malcolm III to become Queen of Scotland, and her daughter Matilda, Yaroslav's great-granddaughter, married Henry I to become Queen of England in 1011. To become Queen of England in 1100. After Yaroslav's son-in-law, Harold Hardrada, invaded and contributed to the fall of Anglo-Saxon England to William of Normandy, Gutha Haraldsdottir, daughter of the last Saxon king, Harold Godwinson, went into exile in Rus, where she married Yaroslav's grandson, Vladimir Monomach. The marriages between Yaroslav's family and Casimir of Poland are particularly interesting. After Bolesław's death, Poland had fallen into chaos for a while. This is noted in the tale, although it gets the timeline wrong. Despite the fact that both Vladimir and Yaroslav had gone to war with Poland and Yaroslav had teamed up with Mstislav to retake the Chervan towns once again, it was better to have a stable neighbour than who knows what might turn up. Casimir had spent a while exiled in France with his mother, but he returned to reunite the country under his rule 
with the assistance of Henry III, the Holy Roman Emperor. If you've listened to the members' episode on early Poland, you'll remember that Polish rulers had to juggle relying on the Holy Roman Emperor, who regarded them as his vassals and mere dukes, and distancing themselves to assert their own authority. The double marriage between Casimir and Dobroniga, and then later Casimir's sister Gertrude and Yaroslav's son Izyaslav, was likely intended to provide Poland with an ally to counterbalance the Germans. It gives us an interesting episode in the tale, which I'm sure some of you picked up on. According to the Russian chronicles, Yaroslav attacks the Mazovians, a rebellious region of Poland, on several occasions. According to the Tver chronicles, in 1043, Yaroslav and Kasimir attacked the Mazovians together, But in 1047, the tale says that Yaroslav attacked and conquered the Mazovians, killing their prince Moislav, and subjected them to Casimir. That is, Yaroslav conquered them and then handed them over to Casimir to rule. I think you'll agree that's pretty unusual. It's the only such instance in Rus history. Despite these friendly beginnings, we're going to see a lot of trouble due to the offspring of these marriages. So, was Yaroslav wise? The meaning of words can shift with time, and maybe learned or clever would be better. Vladimir had brought education to Rus. Remember that? bit in the tale where he takes children from the nobles to train them and their families treat them as if they had died. Yaroslav is the first ruler of the educated generation. The tale tells us that Vladimir had people read to him, but that Yaroslav loved reading himself. He ensured his children were educated. This was not yet the norm across Europe. When his daughter Anna married Henry and moved to Paris, she was surprised to find that her husband could not read or write, and wrote home complaining that the French were ignorant and dirty. Although Yaroslav rode his luck to the throne and failed in his diplomatic and military ventures almost as often as he succeeded, I think we have to recognise him as a successful king. He built on Vladimir's work to establish Rus as an independent power. Kiev grew into one of the biggest cities in Europe, comparable to London or Paris, and was acquiring the buildings and trappings of a major capital. As Christian Raffensperger sums up, quote, The mid-11th century was a wonderful time for the Rusians. Their traders were active all over Europe enlarging the trade routes into Central Europe and being ranked with a who's who of the world in the grand markets of Constantinople. The Russians were establishing their reputation as a European presence in the company of cultural and economic leaders. End quote. Franklin and Shepard note that the reality of Yaroslav's reign did not quite match up to the rhetoric in the tale, He exercised limited rule through rather basic institutions of government. Much of what he did was derivative and imitative. But overall, they also agree that, quote, The result of his reign was a characteristic synthesis, which, with modifications over time, was to become almost definitive, setting the parameters of collective identity among the Rus, for whom the reign of Yaroslav came to represent a kind of golden age. The synthesis meshed features from the Scandinavians, the Slavs, and the Greeks. Its components were linguistic, aesthetic, confessional, and political. The various elements emerged and converged slowly, and by no means inevitably. The package was put together deliberately in Yaroslav's program of patronage and public works. End quote. But did he manage to solve the problem of succession? Before we get to that, we're going to take a detour for an episode and look at what daily life was like 
for the people of Rus. Until next time, thank you for listening.